gifts of the Holy Ghost, the power to heal the sick and the afflicted, the power to survive deadly poisons, are the only way to survive the coming three and a half year tribulation. These gifts, direct from the power of heaven, are more valuable than any prepper's survival skills. If you persevere to the end of this video, I hope to have that more fully explained. I hope to explain the apostasy of the early church, which led to the loss of these gifts and why we need them so desperately to return now. You have probably heard modern Christians say Mormonism represents the false prophets mentioned in the Bible. For false Christ and false prophets shall arise, and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. So are the LDS, the false teachers and false prophets, referred to in the Bible? What did the Apostle Peter say about it? Who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Does this apply to the LDS, or perhaps it more fittingly applies to others? Would it be helpful to more fully explore the first Christians themselves, and what they wrote about false teachers? Let's look at some early Christian literature that is as old as or older than the Latin Vulgate Bible. There are literally volumes of early Christian works that predate the Nicene Council and are not in the Bible. Many books were deliberately withheld from the Bible by the Catholic Church. Obviously not every one of these books is true, but after 2,000 years of the Dark Ages, no one of their own learning, absent the discernment given of God, has the wisdom to say one way or another. So I maintain these books are fair game to bring into the discussion. The light of Christ is given to all men so that they may discern which is true and which is not. Let's start with the ancient Christian book, The Recognitions of Clement. In this book, a Roman citizen named Clement traveled with Peter and recorded Peter's sermons. In one sermon concerning false teachers, Peter said, The devil, fearing lest the true religion of the one and true God should be restored, hastened straightway to send forth into this world false prophets and false apostles and false teachers, who should speak indeed in the name of Christ, but should accomplish the will of the demon. Wherefore observe the greatest caution, that you believe no teacher unless he bring from Jerusalem the testimonial of James, the Lord's brother, or of whosoever may come after him. For no one, unless he has gone up thither, and there has been approved as a fit and faithful teacher for the preaching of the word of Christ, and he brings a testimonial thence, is by any means to be received. The James referred to in this book is James the Less, and is described as the earthly brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. James was also the son of Joseph the carpenter and the adopted son of the Virgin Mary. See History of Joseph the Carpenter, The Martyrdom of James by Hegesippus, Mark 6.3, Mark 15.40, and the Pseudo-Gospel of Matthew. James was ordained under the hand of Jesus Christ to be the archbishop or chief bishop over all the church. James the Less is not to be confused with the Apostle James, the son of Zebedee and the brother of the Apostle John. Neither is he to be confused with the Apostle James, the son of Alphaeus and the probable brother of Matthew, or Levi the tax collector. Many modern churches only recognize the two James who were apostles, in case anyone gets confused. The problem is there has not been a chief or presiding bishop over the church founded in Jerusalem in some 1900 years. After the first chief bishop, James, suffered martyrdom, and after his cousin Simeon also suffered the same fate, there was never again a chief bishop in Jerusalem to preside over the church. So if this statement is true, that the people are not to accept any teacher unless they bear the testimonial of the chief bishop of Jerusalem, then how does that put modern Christianity? None of them come under the banner of the chief bishop of the church. Not even one. According to Peter, by this standard, none of the modern churches are to be accepted. 
except as false teachers. Why is that important? An early church father named Hegesippus, A.D. 170, explained how the church was kept in the unity of the faith by the succession of bishops, and how apostasy began to creep its way into the church. I will provide a link to the writings of Hegesippus in the description below. Speaking of the bishops, Hegesippus says, in the case of every succession and every city and the state of affairs is in accordance with the teaching of the law and of the prophets and of the Lord. And after James the just had suffered martyrdom as had the Lord also, and on the same account again Simeon the son of Clopas, descended from the Lord's uncle, is made bishop, his election being promoted by all as being a kinsman of the Lord. Therefore was the church called a virgin, for she was not as yet corrupted by worthless teaching. Thebulus it was, who, displeased because he was not made bishop, first began to corrupt her by stealth. The first line of chief bishops, starting with James, the brother of the Lord, did not last beyond the late 1st or early 2nd century. According to Hegesippus, James the Less, the chief bishop of the church, and the brother of the Lord was thrown off the pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem during the Passover for refusing to denounce Christ before the gathering of the people. The fall did not kill him and the people stoned him. He survived this too and was finally done in when struck with a fuller's beam. This happened shortly before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. After James, Simeon the son of Clopas, who was an uncle of the Lord, succeeded James as bishop of Jerusalem. During the reign of Trajan Caesar, who reigned as emperor from 98 to 117 AD, Simeon was tortured and crucified when he was 120 years old. As Hegesippus implies, this effectively ended the office of the chief bishop of the church and opened the door to apostasy. In addition to this, each of the apostles were put to death in the various parts of the world they were sent to preach until only the apostle John survived. A few years after John was allowed to return from his exile on Patmos, he too disappeared from the knowledge of the world. After the church was left without its original leaders, it was led into apostasy by false teachers. Hegesippus describes the apostasy of the church. Up to that period, the church had remained like a virgin, pure and uncorrupted. For, if there were any persons who were disposed to tamper with the wholesome role of the preaching of salvation, they still lurked in some dark place of concealment or other. But, when the sacred band of apostles had in various ways closed their lives, and that generation of men to whom it had been vouchsafed to listen to the godlike wisdom with their own ears had passed away, then did the confederacy of godless error take its rise through the treachery of false teachers who, seeing that none of the apostles any longer survived, at length attempted with bare and uplifted head to oppose the preaching of the truth by preaching knowledge falsely so called. Remember that Jesus prayed in John chapter 17 that he wished his disciples should be one with each other, just as Jesus is one with his Father in heaven. Is there any unity in modern Christianity? Currently, there are some 40,000 differing sects and churches, each proclaiming a way towards salvation over a path which none of them have personally trod. Obviously, there is no unity, and that is not a good thing either because unity in the faith of Jesus Christ is entirely necessary. The obvious reason there is no unity is because there are a lot of false teachers which divide the people. There is no other explanation. The first century church was a house of order. Men were called and ordained into the priesthood. And when they traveled abroad as missionaries, they acted under the authority of the church authorities at Jerusalem. This was how it was done up until the leadership of that church no longer survived. How many modern Christians believe in an ordained priesthood? Some do, many don't, especially in the United States. What does the Bible say about it? Acts 1.22 states, 
beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. What did the Apostle Paul say about the ordination to the priesthood? No man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. How was Aaron called? In Exodus 25-28, through 28, the Lord commands Moses in a revelation to ordain Aaron unto the priest's office. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother, and his sons with him, from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. Aaron was literally called of God by revelation into the priesthood, just as Hebrews 5.4 requires. So what do modern-day Christians think about that? Many churches believe that such things are no longer necessary, that revelation has done away with the end of the church age. Many Orthodox churches still believe in an ordained priesthood, but they do not do so by revelation as the Apostle Paul requires. The LDS Church is different from all other modern churches. Edward Partridge was the first man in almost 2,000 years to be called by actual revelation from heaven to be the presiding bishop of the church. I have called my servant Edward Partridge and I give a commandment that he should be appointed by the voice of the church, and ordained a bishop unto the church, to leave his merchandise and to spend all his time in the labors of the church, to see to all things as it shall be appointed unto him in my laws in the day that I shall give them. And this because his heart is pure before me, for he is like unto Nathaniel of old, in whom there is no guile. Below is a letter written by the Apostle Peter to James, the chief bishop at Jerusalem, describing the apostasy creeping into the church. It can be found in the Clementine homilies. Our word of truth will be rent into many opinions, and this I know not as being a prophet, but as already seeing the beginning of this very evil. For some among the Gentiles have rejected my legal preaching attaching themselves to certain lawless and trifling preaching of the man who is my enemy. And these things some have attempted while I am still alive to transform my words by certain various interpretations in order to the dissolution of the law, as though I also myself were of such a mind, but did not freely proclaim it, which God forbid. But these men, professing to know my mind, undertake to explain my words, which they have heard of me more intelligently than I who spoke them, telling their catechumens that this is my meaning, which indeed I never thought of. But if while I am still alive they dare thus to misrepresent me, how much more will those who shall come after me dare to do so? In yet another example of the early apostasy, in the Bible the Apostle John complained about a man in the church, casting out true believers. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Now remember what the Savior said regarding those who teach a doctrine different than what he teaches. Whosoever, therefore, shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus tells us that if we love him, we should keep his commandments including his exhortations to keep in the unity of the faith. We should believe in and teach the same doctrines as the apostles knew and taught. But with 40,000 different churches and everyone going their own way and teaching their own doctrine, unity is not currently possible in the world. This is why a restoration of the first century church was necessary. 
The LDS Church, founded as a restoration of the first century church, the doctrines of repentance, baptism in water for the remission of sins, the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost, ordination to the priesthood, etc., are the same as what the first century church taught. Notice also, as quoted earlier, how Peter describes his church as a restoration of the church. The devil fearing lest the true religion of the one and true God should be restored. Peter was talking about Jesus restoring the one true church to the world during his ministry in Jerusalem. This implies that the church had existed on the world in previous dispensations prior to Christ's ministry, but needed to be restored. The restoration of the church in the last days is essential for both our spiritual and temporal survival. Consider how terrible the coming three and a half year tribulation is going to be. When American Christians also realize the rapture will not happen in the way they imagined it, and they will have to endure the tribulations, many will become so shocked they will not be able to endure it. The Savior promised in Mark 16 that those who believe and are baptized shall be saved, and those who don't shall be condemned. The gifts of the Holy Ghost shall follow them that believe and are baptized. They shall heal the sick, raise the dead, prophesy in tongues, cast out devils, and survive being poisoned, and many more miraculous gifts. This is an amazing statement. These gifts of the Holy Ghost are exactly what we need so desperately to survive the coming tribulation. They are the ultimate survival prepper skills, if you will. When people become sick with plagues, with nuclear fallout, with injuries sustained from war, earthquakes, floods, fires, etc., the gift of the Holy Ghost of healing and even raising the dead is exactly what we need. When those who are endowed with the Holy Ghost are promised that poison will not hurt them, how valuable will that be when nuclear fallout and radiation pass over your land? There is another great false teacher and false prophet that we must all know about, and we have to contend against in the last days, and that is the great Antichrist. Back to the recognitions of Clement, the Apostle Peter said, Those signs which are of the good one are directed to the advantage of men, as are those which were done by our Lord, who gave sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf, raised up the feeble and the lame, drove away sicknesses and demons, raised the dead, and did other like things as you see also that I do. Those signs, therefore, which make for the benefit of men and confer some good upon them, the wicked one cannot do except only at the end of the world. For then it shall be permitted him to mix up with his signs some good ones, as the expelling of demons or the healing of diseases. By this means, going beyond his bounds and being divided against himself, he shall be destroyed. And therefore the Lord has foretold that in the last times there shall be such temptation that if it be possible, the very elect shall be deceived. That is to say that by the marks of the signs being confused, even those must be disturbed who seem to be expert at discovering spirits and distinguishing miracles. But the Antichrist will be exposed to the world by two prophets in the last days. There is another obscure first century prophecy that few people know about. In the history of Joseph the carpenter, the Savior tells his disciples this remarkable prophecy. Concerning the passing of his earthly father, Joseph the carpenter, the Savior says that everyone who is born into this world is also ordained of the Father to die, beginning with Adam. This prompted a question by his apostles. We apostles, when we heard these things from our Savior, rose up joyfully and prostrated ourselves in honor of him, and said, O our Savior, show us thy grace. Now indeed we have heard the word of life. Nevertheless we wonder, O our Savior, at the fate of Enoch and Elias, inasmuch as they had not to undergo death. For truly they dwell in the habitation of the righteous, even to the present day nor have their bodies seen corruption. 
Yet that old man, Joseph the carpenter, was nevertheless thy father after the flesh. And our Savior answered and said, Every prophecy, therefore, which my Father has pronounced concerning the sons of men must be fulfilled in every particular. But with reference to Enoch and Elias, how they remain alive to this day, keeping the same bodies with which they were born. And as to what concerns my father Joseph, who has not been allowed as well as they to remain in the body. Indeed, though a man may live in the world many myriads of years, nevertheless at some time or other he is compelled to exchange life for death. And I say to you, O my brethren, that they also, Enoch and Elias, must towards the end of time return into the world and die, in the day, namely, of commotion, of terror, of perplexity, and affliction. For Antichrist will slay four bodies, and will pour out their blood like water, because of the reproach to which they shall expose him, and the ignominy with which they in their lifetime shall brand him when they reveal his impiety. And we said, O our Lord, our God and Savior, who are those four whom thou hast said Antichrist will cut off from the reproach they bring upon him? The Lord answered, They are Enoch, Elias, Sheila, and Tabitha. When we heard this from our Savior, we rejoiced and exulted, and offered all glory and thanksgiving to the Lord God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Could it be that Enoch and Elias are the two prophets spoken of by John in Revelation chapter 11? It says that these two prophets will stop the rain from falling for three and a half years while they prophesy in the streets of Jerusalem. If any man tries to stop them, fire will come out of their mouths and devour them. Then, when these two prophets are finished, they will be killed and their bodies will lay in the streets three days while the world celebrates and gives gifts one to another. And who are Sheila and Tabitha? Can anyone answer that question for me? So there will be an Antichrist in the last days to perform miracles and heal and deceive the people, even the very elect. And there will be two prophets come in the last days to expose this Antichrist to the world. We really need the gifts of the Holy Ghost. We need the gift of discernment, so we are not deceived by the Antichrist. We need the gift of healing, speaking in tongues, and be able to survive poisons. People don't realize what a precious gift God gave to the world through Joseph Smith. They don't realize what a precious gift Mormonism is to the world. They don't realize that our very survival and our eternal salvation depends on it. For those of you who are honest of heart, no matter what your persuasion is, and you truly have a desire to serve God in these last days, my hope is that I might have instilled within you some thoughts for you to consider. That you might consider the sentiments of the first Christians. That you might discern what the scriptures mean when they warn us of false prophets and teachers. But don't take my word for it, for I am only a mortal sinner prone to mistakes. Get down on your knees and pray to Father in heaven in the name of Jesus Christ that your mind may be open to the truth through the sure word of God, and that you not put your trust in the arm of flesh, no matter who that arm of flesh is. We have only one chance in this life to truly be saved. If we blow it here, we may find ourselves suffering out a long wait in spirit prison until our judgment day, where we will be judged for our works. Is it really worth it to put our trust in our one chance at salvation in the arm of flesh and hope they are not false teachers? Shouldn't we take more seriously our eternal salvation? This life is only short and temporary. The life to come lasts an eternity.